Yo guys, I'm Matt Nash. Welcome to my studio in Amsterdam. Today I'm going to be taking you through uh, my newest track on Musical Freedom, which is called Know My Love. Um, it's sort of quite um, a minimal track, there's not loads of elements going on, just a few really strong elements that carry the track all the way through uh, with a really nice vocal and lots of really quite, um, I've cut around with a lot of the vocals and pitched up lots of stuff and I'm going to take you through how I've done all that today. So the, the main thing with this bass sound that really makes it work is the processing on it. It's a really simple saw uh, with a tiny bit of attack. Um, but if I play the sound without the processing, you can hear really, really kind of a bit shitty, but with the processing, really makes it like that big, uh, big, big vibe. So I'll start, all I'll do is I'll bring in each plugin one at a time. So the first uh, plugin we've got here is Quadrifuzz, which came with Cubase 4, uh, but still working great with my Cubase 8. Um, I love this, you'll see it absolutely everywhere over all of the projects. Um, but it's just a distortion that I cannot get from any other plugin for some reason. Um, so yeah, this one really like, really drives, you can hear like how much, you kind of, you kind of lose a bit of low end out of it, but you gain so much like presence and character from it. Um, so next up I've got the Fab Filter um, EQ. Um, just adding a little bit of top there, a few shelves and taking out the low because I put uh, the low end I wanted to do separately with the sub um, and I'll, I'll go to that after this synth. Now the, the reverb on this, I've used like a really small reverb. I spent a lot of time messing with this because originally I had the decay quite long because I wanted it to, to still feel really big and not that up close. Um, so I really had to mess with the length of the decay on it and as I produced the tune and, and kept going I kept drawing it back until it was at a place but like, without the reverb it kind of like really really dry uh, and obviously with, when you add a reverb like that obviously you can't have the low end going through that it will just your whole mix will fall to shit I can say shit right all right next up is the the CLA this is just this is just setting a, like a tiny amount on the peak reduction and the game is just kind of left the same. It's just doing a tiny bit of compression and what it's doing, it's, it's kind of squeezing the reverb down with the sound so it all feels really glued together. Um, and then next up we have the Camel Fat, which I absolutely love using. You'll see it on nearly every channel today. Um, and the main thing I use, apart from using the, the, the bandpass filter on it and moving those up and down in the rise sections and everything, the main thing I use it for is sidechain and the way I set it up is on uh, the LFO section here and I just set the, um, it to ramp up at one quarter um, and then I, it's just a depth so you can just basically really simply control uh, the amount of sidechain, you know, um, and it's, it's a really simple way to just get it up and get it, get it rocking really quickly. Um, and it's also cool because like on some sounds they needs a lot less sidechain and some it does more. But you'll also see I have a sidechain bus for some sounds as well because you can do it for every single one as well. Um, and then I don't know, there's no distortion on there as well. Um, and that's it. And then I have one more EQ where I've just added in a little dip around um, around 100, 150. And that's pretty much the uh, processing for the bass sound. But what, what really makes this bass sound work, like it has to progress through the track. And I have another patch that comes in here. Uh, it's just a, quite a simple Nexus patch, um, but it's really edited quite a lot. Uh, now what I really like with, with Nexus, I know Nexus is kind of a bit of Marmite, you either love it or you hate it. But I find I can get some really interesting sounds by, because a lot of the Nexus patches are made up of four layers, but sometimes there's some really great stuff, sometimes there's some really crap stuff in there. So I like to mess around with the layers, the volumes of the layers and the processing of the layers that make up that sound. And then also mess with this filter mod because it, you get some really interesting results with, the, um, with it. You know, this sound before uh, was kind of different, you know. That's what it sounded like before and you can get some really interesting sounds out of it. And then what I've done here is I've gone 
Um, I've ran out of processing slots, so I've also sent it to a group. So before, like, obviously before it just sounds really, really dead. Bit of EQ, taking out some body and, and bringing up some presence and some of the highs as well. And then the quadrifuzz, again, you can hear it bringing a lot of things. But obviously with this, it's like a multi-band distortion. So you, you can add in like highs and lows. I don't know why I've put in loads of low on there. I've probably rolled it out in the EQ later. Um, and then again, my favorite, Valhalla again, but I've actually got a really long decay on this, but because the notes are so far apart, you can kind of get away with having a really long decay. Um, and then we have a Renaissance EQ, just adding a little bit of sparkle. And then another EQ here. I think actually that Renaissance EQ wasn't going to be on. Doesn't sound right. Yeah, and this is the main bit here. What I've done is I've kind of, um, sometimes when you scroll through some of the presets in Camel Fat, you can get some really interesting results. And um, this one's got quite a few things on the LFO. So it's got this, there's, there's two LFO parts to Camel Fat. And um, I put the side chain, the same on the bass sound, but I've actually got it a lot higher at 70% on this one. This is, and then also I've got a, an LFO on the uh, filter hit so it basically makes a sort of like a gated 16th effect what's yeah 116 so you get like a you can hear like a coming in after all the sounds if i hear it take it off it's quite plain but it's almost like it just captures the the reverb more than the actual sound um so that's really really basic and then also this distortion section up here i really like using uh, the tube and the exciter both bring a lot of energy to the sound. Um, so that's that, but then these sounds, they sort of, uh, these two together sort of play really nicely. You can hear. So they're, they're basically the top melody is just doing a few specific notes from the bass line melody. So all I've got is I've basically, I ran out of processing slots when I was doing it. And I just, I just ran it into another EQ when I was doing some more mixing. Um, and I just further EQ'd it a little bit more. It looks like I was using a wow filter, but um, I don't think I ended up leaving it on there. Um, so that's, that's it. Not quite as exciting as I pan <laughs> planned it to be there. Um, and then, as I said, as with that uh, lead bass sound, obviously, it's got quite a big reverb on it. So the sub the low frequencies couldn't come from that sound. It had to have another patch. So all I've got here is a basic sine wave from Nexus. Really, really simple. It tends to be my go-to for like basic signs. You could go get it out of Serum or Synth. It wouldn't make any difference. It's really, uh, really not complicated at all. Um, but without the processing, it's kind of lacks its, it's, uh, its body basically. So I just messed with the processing until it came together, but without it, it's like, it's quite simple. It's doing the same, um, same melody and rhythm as before. Um, but I've actually ended up taking a lot of the, sort of any frequencies above a certain amount out. So we'll go through those now. So first there was uh, Camel Fat. Again, I'm not doing any processing or filtering here. It is purely just to set up the side chain, uh, but I've got it at 100% because I really didn't want it interfering with the kick drums. Um, so that's not doing crazy amount. Now this plugin, uh, which is by BBE, the Harmonic Exciter, uh, Maximizer even, uh, it's really, really good uh, for adding frequencies in the low end. Um, and I prefer to add frequencies using this than EQ when I'm looking to fatten the sound up a little bit. So all I've done with this is I've taken the, the low mix and this corresponds to the low tune frequency. So I just dialed it in at 60 hertz and added it in. And um, you can hear, hopefully you can hear if you're listening on some good speakers, what more it brings. It just adds some, uh, some real body and some more harmonics down in, in the low end. Um, and then next up, I've got a C4 compressor by Waves. And what I ended up doing, I kind of, this is kind of weird. I was applying some compression I was try, when I was mixing the track and trying to get my kick and low to sit together. I ended up just, because this is a multiband compressor, um, I ended up just soloing the real sub frequencies and just leaving out everything else. So literally, it was, it's just the, the sub frequencies in the end. Um, that's literally, and then I've got a Renaissance EQ again, rolling off, just didn't want any of that top end in there. Um, cool. 
Right, so that's pretty much the, the main bass sounds in, um, well, all of the synth sounds in the drop. I'll play them together just so you can get an idea. <laughs> Yeah, so they sort of like covers quite a bit of the the, the audio spectrum. Um, but then what I ended up doing with the main uh, Silinth patch was um, it, it basically, uh, how do I explain this? So the intro and the verses basically it has, it just repeats a bar loop basically and then filters down into the, to the rest of the track and that's sort of what kept it progressing along. So basically the main thing here is um, when it comes into the, it's mainly the end of this bar just before the first drop. It's quite simply just moving the, um, the camel fat filter there. So if I take that back to here, I've just used the, the BP filter on the um, on, uh, camel fat. And that, that is, you know, I also use the DJM filter quite a few times to do that sort of stuff, but I like this one because you can move both high and low pass at the same time. Um, and then again, in the verse part, it when it first comes in, it's just ramped up really, really high. Yeah, so that's pretty much everything for that main um, sound, apart from like the cutoff opening a tiny bit more on the second drop. Um, yeah, and then so if we go to the the first breakdown, that, well, the first sort of chorus section, let's say, um, the only other element in there is a piano, um, and that here is it's Nexus again, just the Nexus Grand Piano, um, some quite big chords in there, and then I always find with the with with the Nexus Grand, uh, for me anyway, there's there's always a little bit too much body in it. So I always end up using the, I just put the hi a high pass filter on there, um, and then I go into a CLA 2A just to squash the piano with the the reverb on it, um, and that makes a really nice difference. And then other than that, just uh, taking a bit of a bit of low mid out in with the EQ, and then the DGM filter which I spoke about. Earlier, it's just which is mimicking the the filter off the uh, DJ the Pioneer DJM mixes, and that's really cool just because it, it kind of when if you leave the resonance up, it kind of gives you that same effect that you get off the mixer. So you can hear just before it drops here, you get like a, which is a really cool way to sort of use like a little filter sweep. So the first like the kick drum here, loads of people do loads of really crazy work to their kick drum, but I have a kick drum that I absolutely love and use religiously, and it tends to be the same one as well. Uh, but I've done like a little bit of EQing, but when you're EQing your kick drum, it is literally all I'm trying to do is get that EQ and uh, uh, just to get them to sit together nicely with the bass. It's mainly about just getting the kick drum, the low end of that and the bass to sit together really nicely. That's pretty much the, the only thing I'm doing. The kick drum already sounds great. I'm only taking stuff or putting stuff in to, to get the balance between the kick and the bass to be really tight. Um, so the kick drum here, you can hear, is just it's pretty pretty basic to be honest. Um, I can't say like specifically while I've done of these, this was just what I was doing to try and get it to sit with the bass as best as I could. So the the bass and the sub together create this really nice locked in. You know, it sound you get that low end woof that's in there. I'm not sure if you can hear it so well, but that's just a case of just EQing them both. I don't have a specific, you know, formula to it, but I it's usually using. I tend to use the the, the harmonic maximizer either on the sub or the kick drum, depending on which is going to carry the most low end, you know, power. It's usually on the sub sound, um, but those two together, it, it, you, those have to be together if you want, you know, it to work in the club. Um, and then, yeah, those those two together it sounds really nice it, it always takes me ages to get it right but once it's right it's right with the kick drum i have i was very lucky that uh, a mastering engineer that i use a lot um i pretty much use them use them on every track just gave me a 
a few specific kick drums to use and um, it's just I've got about eight kick drums and um, I've heard them all before and I kind of know which ones work in what sort of tracks. Uh, I know that it's the, the kick's going to have the right amount of, of sub and it's going to have the right amount of punch, punch even and I tend to just go from that small roll of kick drums. Uh, I know it's kind of lazy um, but to be honest like choosing a kick drum for me isn't the most creative part of making a track. Uh, for me I want to get in, I want to get my ideas down, I want to get uh, my melodies and, and get on to the good stuff. So for me, I'm not going to sit here. I have got a friend of mine who is like a professor with kick drums. I was in, a, in the studio with a friend and uh, he built his kick drum from scratch. And it, it, is, it is amazing watching it done. But like, I feel that those hours are better spent coming up with, with song ideas. So I'm not overly um, into sitting there and crafting the perfect kick drum from scratch. Uh, okay, so we're gonna quickly we're gonna go look at the drums. The drums on this, there's like uh, it's pretty simple. It's mainly made up of a couple of different loops that I slice up and about. Sometimes, uh, sometimes I use individual hits, but more often than not, um, I'll go and slice out the sounds I want from different ones. Uh, so there's basically a bunch of loops. And to be honest, these guys they don't even have that much processing on. I'm usually just rolling out the low. So this loop here is mainly sort of a shaker with a really tight sort of thing in there, like a little sort of knocky clap. And I've got this loop here as well. Um, and I've EQ'd this one again. I put a little bit more low end in there, but again, I think it was this one. This one has a DJM filter because what I did with this loop is I sliced out the hi-hats for the verses so I could have like, um, a loop and then the, the DJM, no, not that one, this one, like, no? No, I didn't end up filtering it, I just volumed it. I don't know what they're doing on there then. So um, I just sliced out the hats from this busier loop here for the verses and then let it roll up when it was out. And then I've sliced up this loop here to fit to my groove a little bit better. And that's just got the, the claps in. And uh, I, I, this one's got a DJM filter because in the intro it has like, um, like it, I did quite a cool effect on here where it's like. And that basically because, because it's this DJM filter mimics the, um, the resonance from the DJM mixes, you kind of get that, that similar sound to what you get when you're in a, in a club and the DJ is using that filter. I actually did that by accident and I was like, I, I, I usually I'm always turning down the resonances because it kind of can sound a little bit cheap. But for some reason, in the mix, this one sounded really cool. Yeah, you can see here, this is the, the curve and it's sort of, not quite sure why I did it like that. But, um, you know, the, the weird decisions you make when you're making songs, right? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's you can see that, that's just moving that one there. Uh, cool, so that's pretty much all of the drums. I think there's a couple of other like little fills here and there. Let me just quickly find those. Yeah, so I've got like a little um, a little snare roll just b before it drops here, which again, I've just sliced up some snare hits. And uh, ah, actually, yeah, I put a little bit of EQ. I didn't really like the body of this of those samples, so I really touch them out and then I use this um, this plug in here by uh, sound toys and just just add a little bit of distortion to them not not too heavy but just when you it just I gave it a little bit more like attitude you know um, and then on the second on the second build of the track there's also a rolling snare drum uh, which is a snare drum I've, I've bounced out from a previous song here um, it's just quite a simple rolling snare but then I used the um, the elastic um, the elastic pitch plugin because it, it it's for some reason it's just really really smooth when you're pitching up and down. So I'll show you a couple of other things where I've used it, but it's really good for this uh, for this rolling snare here. It sounds really it sounds really really smooth when you're taking things up and down. So I I really like using that. Um, and that snare was already pre-processed, so I, I just ended up adding a little bit more body. Um, cool. All right, I think that's all of our drums 
that we've got in here. Um, I think it's it's worth um, moving on to the vocals because that's where like most of the there's a lot of really cool stuff that I want to show you on the vocal. Um, right, so we're going to start with the with the uh, with the with the verse vocal. So um, the verse and the chorus. So this is the vo vocal here. So with this vocal, it's um, I I recorded this vocal um, over Skype with the singer in a friend's studio in London who I used to work with, and um, I basically. Uh, I got the project file off him, but he was running Cubase 4, so I already comped, well, I did like a bit of vocal processing pre this project, um, just to get, because his vocal was quite, we did quite a few layers and quite a few stacks, and he sang like a, a high version and a, like a softer low version. So I balanced them out in the previous project and sort of comped them up a little bit, but as you can see on the screen, I still did quite a bit of editing, slicing, and moving phrases around to fit, um, to fit everything in time, basically. Uh, I'm really like, I really, I, I can always hear when I want the vocal to to hit at a specific point and I'll happily sit here and slice and time stretch phrases until I'm happy. Um, so I'll just take you through the processing, which even though it's like, it's the second layer of processing that the vocals has, but it's still very um, significant. Um, so the first thing I used here was the uh, Waves H delay. It's probably my favorite plugin for delay. I really like the ease of the, the filter so you can make sure that there's nothing low coming in there and it, I like having, you know, making sure that your your vocal sits in like a nice broad band but your, your delay is only filling a certain band of frequencies quite nice and it's very easy to adjust the, um, the, the dry wet signal as well and I'm pretty sure there's quite a bit of automation. So with the delay specifically, um, I'll make sure I play that with just the delay. Um, you can see what I've done on the automation here is I've basically in the gaps of the spaces of the vocals, I've, I've made sure that there's more delay there. So it sort of carries it. So you can hear there's a bit here. So you get that like nice delay in between the phrases. I really, really like doing those sort of effects and stuff. Um, and next up, I have my faith favorite reverb again, the Valhalla. But I've got the mix a lot lower than what I was doing with the with the um, synths. Uh, next up, we've got Camel Fat again. I really like side chaining my vocals. It's, some people hate it, some people love it, but I really like. So what I'll do is I'll I always like to automate the the depth of the things. Sometimes I'll put in a little bit more. You know, if I've got a uh, verse vocal that has so for example this bit of vocal has drums over it so I'll sidechain more when there's drums uh, compared to sometimes I'll sidechain less when there's no drums but that's pretty much all that is happening on the camel fat um, next up is a uh, fab filter EQ this vocal had a little bit too much body so again I just dipped a little bit there uh, nothing too crazy um, and then I recently got turned on to this plugin and um, it's really nice to sort of control like the the syllabants and the deessing frequencies stuff like that um, it's, it's really simple to control it if you can and you get like this uh, this nice um, waveform coming through and where the green bits are is where it's controlling those that the too much syllabants on the, on the vocal so I re it's a really great thing from Toya. And then I've got another reverb, but that one's not in use. So that's pretty much. And then, um, yeah, you can see what I've done here. Um, this bit of automation, you can see it says LFO depth. And that mean, that's on the con this one on the camel fat. So this basically means I'm automating the amount of um, side chain coming in in different parts of the vocal. Um, that was more apparent when um, I, because what I did here is, uh, this is like the ver the verse and the chorus. I did have the, there's bits of vocal that sit over the drop and originally they were on this thing. And you can see that I have the side chain 
of the vocal on the drop is at 100% and in the verses it's only at 30%. So that's really important because the the beats the drums are quite heavy in the drop so I really wanted the the vocal to really be pumping with it as well. But I'll go to those that bits of vocals because they're processed a little bit different. The vocals before they came into this project and before I did further processing edited I did compile the vocals in uh, a previous project where uh, there's a bit of auto tune applied to them and uh, just generally it was mainly just balancing them out because when I'm in my final sort of project that the arrangement is like this today um, I kind of I don't want to have like 12 vocal files to be messing with groups and stuff like that so I want to keep it quite simple um, and to be honest when I first exported this vocal in it was mainly so I could just get going and, and see if the vocal that I had just been written was going to work in this project um, and then yeah and that's how that's that's sort of the file how, how the file came in previous to me processing it here um, and then I duplicated off the vocals so that I could have the ad-libs that go over the drop um, section. I really wanted them to have, you know, like to be processed, like, like same sort of processing, just to have a little bit more control. It was mainly the side chaining, to be honest. So, and the delay, I wanted, like, I really wanted there to be a, a lot of delay on these because when I play it with the beat, which I'll quickly do, it carry, you hear the delays carrying over the beat, but the delays are being sidechained. You see in the order here, I've got the delay and then the sidechain is coming after. So it sort of, it st stays in groove with the track, you know? So if you hear it here. Yeah, so that's, that's sort of it. But to be honest, like, the delay is the same settings, the same um, EQ settings on there, but just with a higher dry wet. Uh, the reverb set exactly the same, um, same with the camel fat, but the difference obviously being that the, the depth is a lot higher. Um, and that's, that's kind of important. Um, so that's like with the vocal, that's like, they're like the, the actual singing vocals. There's lots of stuff that I've done with the vocals that I've just sliced bits and, and um, we'll, we'll go on to those now. The main thing we'll start with in the intro, what I did is I sliced, um, there's two bits of slicing of vocals. So the main one here is I took a little, a little snippet of the vocal here and um, I basically pitched each note into, into that melody. You can see up here, so like that, the, I, I, there's like a build in like um, transposing thing inside Cubase and I basically moved these notes to zero, five semitones and to four semitones to sort of create like a little melody in there to keep the intro interesting. So if you hear it here, it's like... And that, again, I've used really sem similar settings to the thing but just adjusting the same plugins slightly. It's the same DSs and EQ, compression, sidechain, reverbs. But then I have got an elastic because what happens at the end of this bar here, it goes... And the way I've done that is just using the elastic plugin, um, same as before, but basically this just goes from here down. And what it is is the timbre is moving at the top with the pitch, they're sort of linked together. Um, and you can see uh, that automation as well. I think I just pitched, yeah, I also, um, when it's going down, when the pitch of this, these notes are going, being pitched down, I'm also automating the reverb mix as well. So like um, you can see here, it's going to reset itself. So the mix goes up as well and it sort of pushes it back and it helps make the transition to when the, um, the, the verse vocal starts. Um, and that's, that's sort of one of the sort of vocal pitching things. There's also um, this vocal here, which again, I've cut, this is one ones from the drop. Similar thing to as before, but it's just like a... And what I've done here is I took the vocal, that's just the, the my love from the, the drop. And what I've done is I've just, I've just pitched up seven and sometimes I just play around and it sounds really cool like that. So I just put it in there and just between this and that, you get like a, a nice amount of vocal. Just creating like little things to keep it interesting whilst it's, you know, 
um, whilst you're going through the, the sort of intro. So there are two things that really um, I really enjoy doing with vocals. Another thing that I really like to do with, with vocals is do like, um, which is this reverse reverb um, trick. And what I've done here is I've taken like a, the first, so what I do is I take, I take this lead vocal here, I take it with no processing, make sure there's nothing on my master bus, and I take this, uh, this little bit here, and I'd, um, do you know what, I'll show you guys how to do it, because it's like my favorite um, production thing. It just really makes, the, um, it ma it's, it's the smoothness, you know, if you're working on a track and just a sound all of a sudden appears out of nowhere, it's not gonna sound like a very produced track. So what I do here is I'd uh, I'd get this here. I go, I take that one note. I'd get a big reverb here. I'd make sure this was at a hundred percent, and then I'd just go like, like that. Obviously, I'd probably do it a little bit more concise than just how I'm doing it quickly for you guys now. But that's what I I would do to make that sort of effect, and then I print it to the to audio, and then reverse the piece of audio, and that's how you get that sort of effect where the vocal comes in here. So it just gives a really smooth thing that like the vocal doesn't just jump out at you. So I really like doing that. I do that a lot with synths as well. Um, and you'll hear that there's this one note that comes in all the time um, here. And that's basically just one of the notes from the, the lead synth patch from earlier. And what I did is I just bounced it to audio, reversed it. But on this time, that's just, so if I took this sample, for example, um, here, and then just reversed it again, um, took the thing off, you can hear that. That's just the, a reverb from the lead sound, basically. Uh, and then what I've done is I've added a nice big reverb with 14, uh, 14 seconds of uh, decay on there, which is just ridiculous to be honest. And then uh, a camel fat just to squeeze it, uh, not a camel fat, sorry, a uh, CLA-2A, just to be a little compression, a bit of EQ, uh, and then that sound comes through a lot, but it's, uh, it kind of, it means you kind of got like a, an effect in your project that is just, um, you know, you could make, you could get that from a Vengeance sample, but it's, unique to this project, but it also is an effect that's kind of come from your sounds in your track, and that's uh, something really nice, and I do that a lot. I also do it with the, you see the piano that comes in in the breaks, I've got like a reverse for that there. So that's that really you know, smooths the piano coming in. So then when you've got the piano coming in reverse, you've got like reverb and the, the synth note and the, the vocal, it, it makes the transitions of your song really smooth and um, it's probably my favorite thing to do in this track. Um, I do it in pretty much every track as well, to be honest. Um, so that's that from the reverse reverbs. A couple of other things that I did with audio that I, that I thought were really cool is I got this Vengeance sample here that's like this. Okay, and I'll just make sure you guys hear this without processing because there seems to be quite a bit on it. So this is it originally. I think I can barely even hear it. So it's really kind of, um, hasn't got that much life. But uh, the camel fat's on here. I uh, put a bit of, bit of side chain on there and uh, some distortion, some tube and a bit of exciter and whatever that one is up there, I'm not sure. Um, a quadrifuzz again, really cool plugin. But the sample was really short on this one, like, uh, you know, when you start with samples, like, I, oh, there is a bit more in there. But I ended up using my own reverb instead, which was the Val, the Val Hell Room. Um, starts to I put quite a long reverb on this one as well. Uh, and then once I squeezed it with the, the CLA-2A, uh, and then a bit of EQ, just took a bit of body, and then there was a little bit too much top end, so I rolled that off. And then I used an envelope shaper, which is, uh, one that's just, uh, you know, there's plenty of plug-in people make this this envelope shaper, but it, this is just the default Cubase one. Uh, I just added a little bit of attack on there, like you can see just to 3.8, not a lot, but uh, just a little bit more hit on it. And then what I did is I got the elastic plug-in out again, which is the pitch shifting one before, and I sort of made like this 
I made the synth go up, but I kind of did it in a weird order because basically the synth, these, this, this uh, sample isn't that coming often. It's like once every bar or maybe twice, right? So if I pitched it up, it, it wouldn't sound very smooth. So I put the reverb and I put the reverb and the compression and the other processing, and then I put the pitch shift on. So the pitch shift would take up the sample, but also the reverb, and you get this really cool effect. So, and I, you know, I was really, I thought that was really fucking cool. Another vocal was sort of um, going back to some of the vocal stuff I was doing earlier. Uh, down right at the end of the track, I added in like this um, extra melody by just um, pitching up the different parts. So that same bit I took from the intro, which was, um, uh, which again was just the, the, the other vocal, like it's meant to be like this. That's like, uh, and I just pushed it up seven semitones. But again, what I did here is uh, I kept, so you've got like my and then love there. So then I basically changed the the love to be a different pitch each each time throughout the the melody essentially. So basically the second part of the vocal was pitching up and down. So here it goes seven semitones, two semitones, seven semitones, minus five semitones. So like you get this, uh, this kind of cool melody thing in there, like. And I, you know, stuff like that for me is, is kind of, uh, it's all the little details that really, uh, you know, make a production feel polished and finished and, and sounding really cool. When I come to master the track, um, I have sort of like a rough, set of a rough plug-in chain that I go through um, that's just various compression, a tiny bit of EQing, and generally some quite hard limiting and clipping. Um, typically, you know, 70% of my stuff gets mastered um, by Wired. Kevin or Cass over there usually do the final master, but generally when you're pitching tracks to labels, they want to hear, a, you know, they want to hear a final version. You don't want to send them a, a pre-master that's like 14 dB too quiet. They're going to be like, what is this? Plus, it's also nice. I did test this out all over the summer before I signed it. So it was really important for me to have a master that sounded great in the club. So I'll quickly take you through that plug-in chain. Um, so I usually start with a, a C4 compressor. Um, and what I do here is I load up the preset called... Uh, multi electro mastering and obviously if your track isn't very electro it's probably not a good idea but and then usually I just because it's multiband I just kind of adjust these the threshold of each frequency here um, and sometimes the gain if I've done a lot of reduction uh, but generally the that as a, as a preset is really great to start with um, next on my master I have a DJM filter again because usually in my builds I like to filter up everything just like a tiny bit before the drops kick it back in that's a really nice way to give like a, some impact there you know what I mean um, and then I use the harmonic exciter the harmonic maximizer the same one I was doing the low end on but generally I don't really dial in that much low end on my overall mix because it kind of kind of make your kick drum and bass a little bit mushy but on this one I've added like a tiny bit uh, and then also I've dialed in the, some high mix at, at 1.4 kilohertz and it's weird with this plugin I can't really figure out what exactly obviously it's boosting but it just kind of opens up your mix in a really nice way you, you should just try it out on your track and you'll be pleasantly surprised it always kind of adds this uh, like uh, this quality to the track that I can't get if I just boost on an EQ in the same frequency range so that's really cool um, and then I've used the Fab Filter EQ again. I've just been messing around with this until I was happy. I ended up boosting. I like top end quite a lot, so I put quite a bit in on, on a high shelf. Did a little dip of a dB there and, and rolled off on the low end just because it had a little bit too much loose low end. Now, the next one I use is the Event Horizon. And um, this is really cool plugin. Like this whole chain, to be honest, was recommended to me for from Wired, just as as a way that I can just get my mixes sounding solid, get them signed, and um, you know, sounding sounding good enough. Obviously, I highly recommend having a mastering engineer go over it. But with this plugin, it's just clipping the mixes quite hard. 
Uh, sometimes I can just use this as my limiter, but uh, sometimes it makes things a little bit too distorted, so I, I don't do it. And uh, or sometimes I do it, but not too hard with the threshold. And then I use the invisible limiter um, afterwards just to, just to push the push the um, the limiter a little bit more. This kind of does like a clipping of the track, and this one is more limiting. So that's pretty much my mastering chain, and I tend to use that on every every track just. And you know you've got to tweak these all like per track. You know some track might have a little bit more bass, or might be a little bit more empty, or a little bit more full. So you adjust accordingly. But that's generally what I do when the track goes out to you know labels, or I want to play it in a set. Yo guys, that's all we got time for. I hope you've enjoyed it. Stay tuned for part two.